Hi, welcome to my video on the first law of thermodynamics. Um, the first law is a tad bit obvious from the modern point of view. Uh, it just says that energy is conserved. Of course, that's not all it says. It says that at the molecular level, at the molecular level, energy is conserved. So it means if you could keep track of all the little molecules as they're moving around, you know, doing their thing, you'd find that energy was conserved. Of course, in real life, we can't do that. There are too many molecules, they move too fast, can't keep track of them. Thermodynamics as a whole, actually, you can think of as what can you do when you can't keep track of the molecules. So the first law tells us what to do. Uh, it says keep track of the heat. Okay? We find that heat is a form of energy, and if we watch the heat flow and include that in our equations, we can save energy conservation. That's what we do. Um, most of what I say in the video is pretty general, but Always as the example in the, in the back or front of my mind is the ideal gas. And especially toward the end of the video, some of the things I say are very ideal gas centric, like adiabatic expansion. So keep that in mind. Okay, enjoy. The first law of thermodynamics is all about energy. And in particular, it says that energy is always conserved. Nowadays, people just tend to accept this statement, but it's actually a little bit surprising from the point of view of basic mechanics. The question of energy conservation in mechanics shows up in collision problems. In an elastic collision, where the objects collide and bounce off of each other, we, we are used to writing down the initial and final total energies and setting them equal to each other to help solve the problem. By contrast, in an inelastic collision, where the objects stick together and then move as one, the energy is not conserved. To resolve this conflict, we have to look closer at the composite object AB. If we were to zoom in on the object, we would find that it was made of molecules arranged in some kind of lattice. And these molecules are always vibrating, that is, they have energy. We'll call this the internal energy. In the inelastic collision, where we thought we lost energy, if we could look close enough, we'd find that the little molecules would be moving faster after the collision compared to before, that is, the internal energy went up. Macroscopically, we measure this as the object getting hotter. We find that heat is just another form of energy, which corresponds to the molecular energy we can't normally keep track of. Another fact from mechanics is that the energy of an object can change through work. When a system does work, it loses energy. Consider an ideal gas inside of a box with a movable partition. The gas exerts a pressure on the box, which causes the partition to move. When it's all over, the partition has moved a length delta L and the gas has done some work on the partition since it exerted a force over that length. To compute the work, we'll just use the formula work equals force times distance. If we assume that the pressure of the gas was constant the entire time, then we'll find that the force on the wall was equal to the pressure times the area, and so the work is pressure times area times delta L. Area times delta L is just the change in volume of the gas, delta V. So the work was pressure times delta V. Now we're ready to write down the equation of the first law of thermodynamics, which tells us how the internal energy of a system can change. The equation is delta E internal equals Q minus W. W is the work done by the gas, and a positive value means that energy has been taken away. Q is the heat flow into the gas, and if Q is positive, that means energy was added to the system. By the way, E internal is sometimes denoted by capital U. Let's talk a little more about the work done by an ideal gas and use PV diagrams to help. Our earlier example was an expansion at constant pressure, that is, an isobaric expansion. And we found that the work was P delta V. That's just the area under this line. As you might have guessed, this area under the curve prescription for computing work is actually true in general, provided that we're careful about the signs. For example, here is an isothermal contraction, indicated by a hyperbolic curve. And if we find the area underneath, we'll find the work done on the gas in order to make this contraction. However, we have to be careful of the sign. Remember that W is defined as the work done by the gas. And so when something does work on the gas, like in this contraction, that's negative W. In general, the work done in going from state A to state B is just the integral of PdV, which is exactly the area under the curve indicating the transition. The sign of the work is encoded in these arrows that I've been drawing on the trajectories, which tell you which way to do the integral. Going from right to left, of course, gives you a negative number. 
In case it wasn't already obvious, it's also true that the actual path in the PV plane matters. For example, this other path which connects the same initial and final states would have extra area not included in the blue region. Let's summarize what we know about work and the first law of thermodynamics for an ideal gas going through its various transitions. For an isobaric process at constant pressure, the work is just P delta V, and the change in internal energy is Q minus P delta V. That's just a rewriting of the first law. In a constant volume process, which remember is called an isochoric process, or isovolumetric process, the work is zero because there's no change in volume. This means that the change in internal energy is entirely Q, just heat flow. An isothermal process, which takes place at constant temperature, is a bit more complicated. Here we have to use the full definition work equals integral of PdV, together with the ideal gas law. Recall that the ideal gas law says that PV equals nKt, and T is constant. So plugging in here, we find that work is the integral of nKt over V dV. Now let's actually evaluate this integral, starting from some initial volume V1 and ending with some final volume V2. Since nKt is constant for this process, that just comes out as a factor in the front, and we find that the work is nKt times the natural log of V2 divided by V1. We should also remember that the equipartition theorem says that the energy only depends on the temperature. And so if the temperature doesn't change, that means delta E internal equals zero. And so the first law of thermodynamics tells us that the heat flow into the system is the same as the work done by the system. There's one more type of ideal gas process we haven't talked about yet, the adiabatic process. An adiabatic process is defined by Q equals zero, so there's no heat flow and delta E internal equals minus W. Now we'll use the equipartition theorem to say that delta E internal is just D over 2 times NK delta T. The work, of course, is still equal to the integral of PdV. We want to put everything in terms of pressure and volume, so let's take a look at this equipartition theorem statement and replace NK delta T with a delta quantity PV, which is just follows from the ideal gas law. Having done that, we can make a use of our formula in the upper right-hand corner, setting delta E internal equal to minus W. In this case, moving the D over 2 to the other side of the equation, we find delta of quantity PV equals minus 2 over D times the integral of PdV. In order to go further in our analysis, we're going to need to simplify things. And the, the simplifying step is going to be to consider an infinitesimal change in volume, infinitesimal amount of work. So I'll change the delta to a d and write d pv, an infinitesimal change in pv, is equal to minus 2 over d times pdv, which is the infinitesimal form of the integral. Now I'm going to use the product rule on the left-hand side of the equation and write d pv as pdv plus vdp. Hopefully the multiple uses of the letter D aren't confusing. So now we're going to take this equation and rearrange things a little bit, writing it as 0 equals quantity 1 plus 2 over D times dV over V plus dP over P. This quantity 1 plus 2 over D has a name. It's called the adiabatic index and is often denoted by gamma. Now we're going to integrate this equation from some initial state 1 to some final state 2 to find that 0 equals gamma times the natural log of V2 over V1 plus the natural log of P2 over P1. From this point, it's just a matter of doing a little bit of algebra to find that the combination P times V to the gamma is a constant in this process, so that P1 times V1 to the gamma equals P2 times v2 to the gamma. All right, with that out of the way, we're free to take a look at a PV diagram to see what an adiabatic process actually looks like. Let's take a look at an adiabatic expansion from some initial volume to some final volume. We know that in this process, p times v to the gamma is going to remain constant. 
And so p is proportional to 1 over v to the gamma, where gamma is some number bigger than 1 that depends on the gas in question. This is a downward sloping sort of curve that looks very similar to an isothermal kind of curve, but is actually not quite the same. Let's remind ourselves what an isothermal expansion looks like and compare it to this adiabatic expansion. In the isothermal case, temperature is constant, so by the ideal gas law, P times V is constant. That means that the pressure is proportional to 1 over V. So the curve is similar to the adiabatic case, but a bit less steep. So if we start in the same state and end at the fi same final volume, we would find ourselves in a higher pressure. Whew. There's one law down.